Welcome to Steam Powered, where I have conversations with women in Steam to learn a little bit about what they do and who they are. I'm your host, Michelle Ong. My guest today is Rachel Lee Neighbors. Rachel Lee is Technical Program Manager leading developer education on AWS Amplify. They previously led documentation for React and React Native at Meta, worked on Edge Browser at Microsoft, and the Web Animation API with W3C and Mozilla's MDN. Join us as we talk about Rachel Lee's journey from award-winning cartoonist to web development, Rachel Lee's passion for developer education, and preparing for your next role. Welcome, Rachel Lee. Thank you for joining me today on Steam Pod. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you today all about your journey. Thanks so much for having me today, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here. Amazing. So you've had an unconventional route to tech and you started out as, well, an award-winning cartoonist, but how did you get into that space? Well, I had always been reading superhero comics since the early 1990s. And it was when a Japanese uh, heroine, Sailor Moon, hit American television that I finally came up with some, some ideas for the kinds of stories I would like to make comics about. I ended up making big-eyed comics uh, sorry, usually myself and my cat you know, called Rachel the Great and Tuna. And these actually became pretty popular. I posted them online. I ended up with a syndication on a popular girls website that was sort of like the teen vogue of its era. And that resulted in um, weekly income and 400,000 readers around the world. So I did that Amazing. for up until my early 20s. And uh, still sometimes I draw comics. Not as much as I used to, though. It is a labor-intensive process. Oh, I can imagine it is. But, you know, I, I saw some of your art style, and that's absolutely amazing. So it, is that, like, was it all self-taught? Did you just have a feel for, you know, doing that sort of artwork? Well, I mean, you go to the library, you get books on anatomy, <laughs> you try to imitate your favorite uh, artist and their style so that you can draw your favorite characters. And eventually you develop one of your own styles. So yes, it, it was self-taught, but also you've got your 10,000 10, hours worth of practice there to blame. Absolutely. Just mastering it bit by bit an hour at a time. That's very, very cool. So how did we get from, you know, cartooning to, you know, web dev? It's, it's not as though a lot of people in this space aren't artistic, but it is an interesting transition. Well, once I made the comics, I had to put them somewhere so that people could read them. I was raised in the middle of nowhere, so I didn't have a lot of friends. I was homeschooled as well, so it wasn't like I was going to school to see people. I would basically not have any contact with people my own age. If I wanted to share something with them, I realized I had to go online. I started with posting my comics to a GeoCity site using the library's computers and internet connections, which were interestingly enough donated by the bill and melinda gates foundation and eventually oh, wow. managed to transition off to a home connection when the local teleservice uh, brought the internet up the mountain as we call it <laughs> we were fortunate to be within the last two miles of copper uh, phone wires so that we could actually oh, get it um, and then i built my own website i used drupal to build a fan site for other teenage girls who loved comics and uh, loved making their own comics and, and talking about them. Um, had to set up my own email newsletter. We didn't have MailChimp back then, so I was installing Tin Can PHP. We didn't have Etsy, so I was installing this shopping cart called OS Commerce, so I could sell the printed version of the comics. I had something like 400,000 teenage girls reading my comics every week uh, after I got syndicated by like that era's version of Teen Vogue. And... Yeah, it was pretty cool. So that's how I ended up in web development was because back then, if you had a huge legion of, of readers who wanted to grow a readership, you also had to be pretty handy with a PHP server. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, back, I used to read so many web comics as well at, well, in that period. And yeah, everyone was just having to roll their own. There, was, there were no ready-made software as a service things for the kinds of things that you needed to do to run you know, a community like that. So yeah, you, you had to kind of figure it out. Michelle, what was one of your favorite web comics growing up? Oh, so many. Uh, gosh, I've forgotten the name of it. It was a witchy one with cats. I like the sound of it already. 
Yeah, I'm trying to remember the acronym COTW, but I can't remember the actual name of the comic. And I read a lot of Mega Tokyo, uh, Sluggy Freelance. I remember Mega Tokyo. Yeah. Um, what else? Not questionable content because that's a newer one. Something positive. Um, yeah, there were there were quite a few web comics then. Like I remember having like a half dozen bookmarks, and every morning's like, oh my god, so many to catch up on. <laughs> I, yeah. I kind of miss that. I get a lot of my webcomics through apps like um, Webtoon and Top Test now. Yeah, do you still catch up on a lot of the ones that you read before, or they kind of fade, faded up by now? Most of them concluded. There's one that is in the act yeah. of concluding right now called Drowl Tales, which is, oh, yes. I mean, it's I been running that. for like a decade, and it's finally concluding. Absolutely. And it's like, it's like watching <gasps> Elf Elf Quest end, you know? It's just like... I'll see you later. Um, it's been <laughs> Absolutely. good. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because you you spend so much time with those things and you get very connected to the characters, and then it's just an end of an era. <laughs> yeah. With the web dev and you know getting into it as you know a profession, it's it's different now, I guess, to back then because you everyone did have to roll their own. You'd have you know coming in without formal qualifications was, I guess, a bit easier back then because everyone just had to teach themselves and figure it out on the way. And it's less of a thing, I guess, than it used to be where, you know, some of the larger companies needed that degree or those letters in order to be able to hire you. So did you find that kind of shift into that environment difficult without formal qualifications in tech? Yes and no. I mean, here's the funny thing about tech. Companies out there, small, medium, and large, always need somebody to be an engineer. Maybe not always design. Uh, if you were a self-taught designer going up against like a SCAD grad, that's kind of rough. Also, designers don't get paid as much as engineers. So self -teaching, teaching yourself design is kind of like, maybe you should teach yourself engineering instead. Higher, higher <laughs> payoff for that investment. Uh, that said, uh, back in the day, people always need somebody to do something. It's still true to this day. It's always going to be, you know, like, we need somebody who can build this using React. And guess <laughs> what? You can go use the React documentation to, uh, to learn how to build this <laughs> React. And you can say, I can help you with that. Won't you give me some money? And it's not that <laughs> difficult uh, when it comes to web development, even to this day. There are more options to learn than ever before. Previously, you kind of had to go get a book and read mm. a bunch of standards and figure it out. Now you can like, ah, go get a course on how to build your first React site or uh, follow some podcasts or some screen screen shares. There's just so much to learn from. What I did notice even back in 10 years ago when I was going up for a really cool role, like a dream role to be a developer advocate at uh, this one company in Portland that was, I've forgotten its name, but it was really well known for designing chips, I think. <laughs> And they wanted to get into HTML5 um, game development, and they needed a developer advocate. And I met a person who had recruiters, contacts, et cetera. They were really cool. They believed in me. I met them at a conference. They are like, yeah, 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 you, you know, get into the pipeline. I filled out this horrible six-hour-long form for their oh, archaic wow. uh, recruiting process. And I followed up with him. I'm like, I haven't heard back. What's up? And he said, oh, our recruiters just blocked it because you didn't have a degree. And so there are some very older companies that expect mm. a four-year degree. And even at places like Microsoft, for certain levels, they sort of expect to see a degree. Um, but if you're talking about small to medium companies, if you're talking about startups, and even I think if you're talking about the newer companies that are large, mm. you know, your, your Googles and your Metas, they care more about what you can do and less about what's written on a piece of paper. The piece of paper tells people that you were able to show up and not flunk, which is nice. It's a great vote of confidence. But a bigger vote of confidence is how many people are using the library that you posted on GitHub. Are you actually able to like maintain your commitments to an open source uh, community? That sort of thing. And those actions really do speak louder than any piece of paper can. Yeah, it's an interesting way in. I've personally found because I started off in corporate work, when I was starting to apply for a lot of those jobs, because I didn't have active 
libraries on GitHub and because, you know, I, I wasn't involved in a lot of open source communities because, you know, my life was spent trying to churn stuff out for a company, it made things a bit difficult. And I did notice that, you know, when people did ask for my repos, it was like, yeah, but there's kind of here and there and there's a couple of patches for things that we used and I really don't know you're going to get much out of it in terms of what I do, but I can't tell you what I do because it's proprietary. So yeah, it, it's, it is a bit of a balance, especially when, you know, you, they are looking for this visible evidence of a body of work. And that is precisely why the portfolio sites of independent web developers are just so lavish. Uh, <laughs> because <laughs> it's like one of the few GitHub repos that's public that you can point people to and be like, yes, the skills of an artist are here. <laughs> um, if you don't have time to maintain your own open source library, uh, this is why every time someone is moving on from one agency job to another, they're like, I'm taking a couple of months off to work on my website. If you're a hiring <laughs> manager and one of your employees is, you know, working on their website, it's like, uh-oh, that's a flag. <laughs> you better watch them. They're working on their website. They're, is that on GitHub? It is not GitHub. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is one of those things like most of the time here in tech in Australia, it was like, oh gosh, they're turning up in suits. They must have interviews. We have to do something. <laughs> it's kind of obvious. I, I like yep. to think that if your manager doesn't realize what you're doing and not paying attention and probably are a very good manager. Yeah. <laughs> oh golly. So how did you get into the web development training kind of side of things? Well, I used to work on courses uh, quite a bit because I was independent, traveling the world, working on animation specs with Mozilla and the W3C. And, you know, giving talks is great, but if you don't make money doing that. You get life experiences and travel, but you don't, you don't get an income. But one thing you can do is you can translate that what you know, if you're a good teacher, you can turn it into a course. Uh, something that people buy so that they can learn from you. And that's a way that I was able to supplement my income. You can still find my courses at courses.rachelneighbors.com. Super plug there. But, uh, you know, the, the thing is that courses became so popular over the past couple of years that now there's an entire industry. You've got LinkedIn Learning, you've got Coursera. Mm -hmm. uh, even boot camps have come out. These are like coding boot camps where you pay a certain amount of money they take you basically through a crash course and learning all the skills you need to be instantly employable when you leave. Um, of course, if you're thinking about going to a boot camp as opposed to doing some courses in self-study, one thing you should always check out is the hire rate outside the boot camp, like how many grads of the boot camp are getting hired. Um, even talking to someone who has graduated from a boot camp and asking them like, did you have the skills that the employers in this market were looking for? These can really help you because not all boot camps are created the same. Some boot camps mm. are definitely for profit machines and some are more about making sure that you have the skills. They have programs where they don't get paid until you get hired or they get paid a percentage. But boot camps are sort of like an alternative to going to a four year college and getting a computer science degree, which doesn't always necessarily get you a job at a big tech company. Boot camps don't necessarily get you jobs at big tech companies too, but they usually can get you a job at a small to medium sized company, which for many people is an excellent, excellent ultimate goal. There's so many options now to get those kinds of skills, especially when we're in a time where a lot of people are also doing sea changes or trying to, you know, find other avenues for exploring the kind of work that they can do. And yeah, even if it doesn't get you into the, one of the big ones, which, you know, for a lot of us is out of their reach geographically for other reasons, it gives you a foot in the door somewhere and you can kind of build that experience. I'd also like to point out something that a lot of people aren't, don't realize about big tech companies. They think they're all in Silicon Valley or Seattle, but the truth is that they usually have wings open in other countries. Mm -hmm. Now, these wings aren't necessarily the epicenters of where things are happening. You know, like Microsoft Australia is definitely serving Australia's business needs as opposed to being a reactor of hot new ideas <laughs> and a leadership center. But if you want to work with great engineers and you want to have the opportunity to be flown into the States for the odd business meeting, uh, working for one of these wings is a great idea. They're always looking to hire local talent. 
and mm. it's a it's an excellent way to you know see see what the corporate culture is like on the other side of the world and i got to tell you having been on the inside um the offices that are in other countries or in other uh centers outside like the main hub or the mothership as it's called <laughs> they tend to have a lot more of a chill atmosphere because people who are running them the leadership there tends to be a little bit more like you know, this is something I'm passionate about. It's close to my family. You know, I'm, I want to keep the office culture healthy. We're doing good work. We're taking, uh, we're taking load off the main hub so that they can complete their projects on time. And so from a work-life balance perspective, I've often seen that the non, uh, non Silicon Valley hubs tend to just be uh, a different vibe. And sometimes that's something people are looking for. That's a very interesting perspective. I hadn't considered that. And, you know, we do have so many of these other offshoot, you know, kind of offices and stuff like that, just because, you know, they need to cater for Europe. They need to cater for Asia. Sometimes there's a really amazing engineer you got to hire and they can't get an American visa. So yeah, build an office for them. <laughs> just for you, tailored. Great. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's a, yeah, I've, I've been talking to a few people in some of these, you know, satellite um, offices and I oh, can't really call them satellite they're a little bit bigger than that and it's interesting to see the difference in the way that they present their particular region's culture and mm. it yeah even if it's not managed by you know people local to that region the vibe that they kind of present for these regions is you know it's all unique and it's all you know very it does feel a lot more chill than the ones kind of based in the U.S. which I find very interesting. Sometimes you want chill. Sometimes you want to go hard and climb the corporate ladder and be in the center of the bustle. Uh, it it really depends. But yeah, just because you're not on the West Coast or unable to plan to go to the West Coast or intimidated by passing the bar that the West Coast requires, that doesn't mean that you can't find um, really amazing jobs from some of the same companies in your own backyard. Um, and that's to say nothing of the cool local startup scenes that might be available to you. Exactly. And that's also coming up a lot faster now than it used to with, you know, just so many opportunities and of course, pandemic. So a lot of, you know, people are starting to find other ways to innovate and create opportunities for themselves, which is also very cool. Let's see. We'll backtrack a bit because you mentioned about the web animation and you are a web animation advocate. So I know you've written a little book about this, but you know, how... How did you get into the web animation kind of side of things for building those APIs? I wanted to give a talk in Hawaii at a CSS conference. So I made them a promise that I could, uh, my, my, job, my pitch that I made was that I would make an animated music video using uh, CSS animations and HTML5 audio and combine nice. these two things to create an interactive music video as I sold it. And I was surprised they took me up on this. And I had one month to make the demo and the talk, and I did it. And ever since then, I've just been using my skills of an artist to create really cool demos for interaction, animation. Uh, I like to make things that people usually wish they could make it work but don't get to. And that's how I ended up working with user interface animation. I wrote a little book about the principles of user interface yes. animation. It's called Animation at Work. You can find it with a book apart at abookapart.com. But yeah, uh, animation is really crucial when it comes to touch interfaces because previously when people were using mice, you know, a cursor on a screen to click around, um, it, it, processors could not support, you know, feedback, visual feedback to human actions. But the actions were kind of so slow that the mind could bridge those gaps. But if you imagine having these same interactions using your phone, like imagine if when you swiped on something, you had to wait just half a second before like the menu opened up or the page changed. You wouldn't be sure if the swipe did it or maybe your slipping finger or like you wouldn't be able to figure out what action you'd taken had caused the reaction. And that's where animation mm -hmm. actually plays, plays a really big role in uh, facilitating those instantaneous human computer interactions. Because it's, yeah, it, it's these subtle bits of feedback that you can offer users when, you know, you don't have a tactile interface and you don't have, you know, all these other things that can give you cues 
for you know mm-hmm. anything that's happened with whatever you're interacted with. So that that's very cool. So as a leader in developer education, how does that kind of look in the landscape of what we're doing now and going forward as developers in this space? Well, it's really great to see companies investing in developer education alongside developer advocacy and developer tooling, because like these are the three pillars upon which you know your product, whatever you're making for developers, either succeeds or fails. And back in the old days, developer used to be able to read through source code and kind of figure out how things were working. But as our code bases have become increasingly more and more abstracted, education has become a really key portion of like any developer community or for that matter product that's being sold to developers without investment in developer education you know you can build it but will people use it i've seen many wonderful projects out there uh, not do very well because they hadn't put the time into developer education that they could have recently i just completed working on the react documentation which you can find at react uh, beta.reactjs.org but before that, I had uh, turned around React Native documentation at reactnative.dev. Now, React Native is kind of like React, but for mobile development. Uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's an output for Android and iOS uh, platforms. And one of the problems with the documentation was it was not updated in sync with releases of the library. So it was out of date and it was unreliable. You, as a developer building or maintaining something in React Native, If you couldn't come to the website and get answers for things like, well, what does this API do? What's this endpoint like? What arguments does this function take? If you had to go into the source code every time you had a question like that, well, you can imagine that that really limited who could build with React Native. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things we did was we turned around and, you know, got the community together, went through the source code, updated all the documentation to reflect the source code. Um, And that's one of the things that um, I call it the second source of truth. Your documentation is the second source of truth with your source being the first source of truth. So developer education goes beyond just docs as well. Docs are the bedrock of any good developer education strategy. But when we talk about developer education, we're talking about like courses for Coursera. We're talking blog posts. We're talking tutorials. We're talking things like kits that meetup organizers or boot camp uh, curriculum designers can just use immediately and say, hey, everybody, we're going to be learning this. One of my favorite community activities that I see is when meetup organizers will just have a couple of hours every other week to walk through a uh, documentation or a setup kit with their attendees and do it as a group thing because group learning is where the magic happens, that accountability Absolutely is just magical so in the developer education field it's all about facilitating group learning efforts making sure that everyone has up-to-date canonical information available they don't have to go digging around through the source code it's like that's such a, an exclusive thing to make people do it automatically screens so hard for folks who just wouldn't know where to get started um, but it's a booming field right now because there are lots of companies out there that have well, they've got things that they want people to build with. Even like if you look at Apple, the amount that they, of engineering time and um, resources they've in, invested into teaching developers things like AR kit, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, and it, it just makes the technology so much more accessible for the people who want to be able to you know, just try and get something off the ground or test out an idea, even if they're very new to the space. And it, you know, it, it's also, you know, a wonderful way to get into the community because, you know, you've got the documentation, you can start building things, you can start talking to people and have a reference point for being able to talk about the technology and the work that you're trying to build. And it's one of those things where, you know, early years of development, it was very exclusive. If you didn't understand how to read the code, it was, you know, it was very exclusionary. And, you know, people would be frightened off from wanting to explore the space because it was very intimidating, not just from the people, but from, you know, the learning curve that you'd be faced with every time you wanted to try something new. So, you know, creating this community through the documentation is so important for, you know, all of us getting to the space or in the space already. You you can look at resources like MDN, uh, Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, It basically documents all of how HTML, CSS, and JavaScript work. 
for, for the web. It's free, it's open source, you contribute to it to GitHub, but it also had like, Mozilla has a, um, a director who oversees it and ensures that various freelance contributors and salary contributors are making sure that it's up to date and maintaining it. But this resource is free, it's accurate, it's very high quality, and it has been the on-ramp into the web development for so many people. Um, yeah. And I think like good documentation that that is free is the most one of the most valuable things that is available out there. People can make great courses from good documentation. They can lead great meetups. They can give great demos. They can build great things. But first, the engineering teams that are out there working on these projects need to make sure that they're communicating what they're working on outward for that community. Yes, and it, it's yeah, it's such an important part of creating, you know, an active developer community and. You know, also as part of the communication, you know, I was speaking to Jessalyn Tanady, who referred me to you, and she was talking about, you know, the translation aspect to make it more accessible to people who aren't English speaking, because technology is so primarily English or dominated by the English language. And that's, again, you know, such a limiting factor when, you know, you have poor documentation, none of it in a foreign language, and, you know, people, you know, you're, you're excluding this entire section of the demographic who wants to get into the space. Absolutely. Um, translations are a whole nother kettle of fish because oftentimes, you know, it costs money to have translators. Um, you can rely on the, the contributions of the community like React documentation does, but then you don't really have anyone overseeing the quality of the translations. Can you be mm. sure that this person who's volunteered to do the translations from Russia isn't putting propaganda in there? Can you read it? Not really. Yep. So it requires... Um, like this is one of those things where doing it right requires an investment of like community managers or professional translation resources. If you have a code base that updates rapidly, that can get very interesting very fast. One thing as a stopgap measure um, that, that actually was interesting, a lot of people uh, learned this from doing research with the React community. A lot of people will use Google Translate um, and a lot of other people will prefer to like read the English if they've got even a passing knowledge of English because they're worried that the translations in their own language are out of date. But Ooh. the interesting thing about running Google Translate is that you can use this particular style of writing English that translates even easier by the machine. And if you do things like add the appropriate no translate tags to the code blocks, you can facilitate this um, instant translation for people right out of the box. Like you can accommodate people with zero translations. You can accommodate that automated translation uh, plugin and make it so much easier. We got a lot of feedback uh, during the original release of the documentation where people are like, I'm using Google Translate. It's also translating the code blocks. And we were like, okay, let's make sure that we're, telling, we're escaping those blocks. So Google Translate is not translating the code. And we were able to come up with docs that, you know, for people using Chrome would be automatically translated into their own language, which it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than doing absolutely nothing. And it's important, yes. even if you can't get a translation effort going, that you accommodate people using those devices that are translating for them. Yeah, that that's very, very cool. And it's, it's wonderful that a lot more people are starting to think about being able to adopt these little, you know, just very, very small things that can help make things so much more accessible in, you know, other languages and other communities. Mm -hmm. It's very, very cool. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Um, and yeah. wherever you can facilitate people who are, you know, bringing the information to their communities, so much the better. Um, React Native, for instance, at one point, the Mongolian React Native community paid to have the documentation translated into Mongolian, wow. um, which was... Like that's amazing and and really sweet, and it would be wonderful if that was something that was you know happening on the regular to have a way to feed those translations uh, into a main repo, kind of like how React does it. But I yeah. think I've underscored how there's always going to be a little lag between translation and the the English version, and there yeah. are ways to accommodate for that lag that should be decent stopgap measures. Yeah, and it, it's it's good that we have those because you know we, we're not going to really get you know perfect translations off the bat for every single language that we can possibly support. It's just completely impractical. 
So having these measures is such a great way of getting people involved and also getting people to understand what is available to be able to help facilitate the access for them. It's very neat. We didn't have this 10 years ago. It's kind no. of amazing. It I think is. something like only 20% of the traffic to React site is from people coming in reading English. Uh, most amazing. of the browsers have a, uh, have a, a language that's uh, a language that's running regularly. That's not for me, uh, not, not English. That is wonderful. And you know, you, you kind of lose perspective when you're in an environment where everything is kind of catered for you as an English speaker. And it's, yeah, it, it's very cool learning about those stats. <laughs> it is. I mean, I remember, I, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but Ruby, uh, Yukihiro Math, I think, is the person who invented Ruby, and he had a mm. Twitter account. And his Twitter account had a translation Twitter account that would translate <gasps> each of his tweets. And because I'd invested time learning Japanese, learning to read it for Sailor Moon, I loved learning Ruby. But because there would be a new re Ruby <laughs> version, and I would have to, like, get out my dictionary and be like, <laughs> what's this new feature? Uh, and you don't have to do that anymore. Now you just, like, bam, Google Translate. Oh, okay, I get it, yeah. Yeah, that that is very, very cool. And I can see a lot of people, like not just yourself, like so many people would have gone through and gone, okay, I, I need to access this. So I'm going to have to teach myself this language side by side. And it's just one of those things that we used to do because we had no other choice. We, we had to kind of, you know, muddle our way through by hand. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And in some ways I kind of miss that, but I also like, I wouldn't wish that on somebody for their livelihood. <laughs> like you should not have to no. like pick through Yukihiro Matsu's uh, <laughs> dictionary one hand to have a job. Yeah, absolutely. Like you, you really don't need that extra layer of friction at all anywhere. <laughs> I've heard enough learning programming paradigms. You don't need that. You don't need I to know. learn like how gerunds work. <laughs> no, we, you really do not need to learn about your particles and your little endings. It's, yes, it's just, it's just completely unnecessary for the extra language just to learn another language. <laughs> so I also saw recently that you did a talk about how to prepare for your next role and, you know, this really fascinated me because I saw that you mentioned this line in The Last Unicorn, which is a fantastic animated film, by the way, one of my favorites. And the unicorn had turned into this mortal woman. And one of the first things she says is, I can feel this body dying all around me. And you relate that to when you start a new job that, you know, you already started your journey to leaving that role. And I really, I laughed so hard at that because it's really grim, but it's, you know, pragmatically, it's very true because we well, don't work in companies for you know one company for our entire life anymore that's not the kind of environment we have for our careers and you know even 15 20 years ago the average was meant to be three to five jobs in one working career but i'm pretty sure the average has gone up by now in tech it's, it's much higher than that like like to get a proper raise or even to be leveled appropriately you'll often have to switch to another company it's just it's par for the course anybody who thinks otherwise is you know, they, they probably got into the startup really early and are doing well enough. They don't have to worry about that. Uh, but for the rest of us, we have to kind of, I don't know if you've heard about the bottom up versus top down uh, theory of flight evolution, where the question is, did dinosaurs learn how to glide down from the tops of trees with wings, proto wings, or did they learn how to hop fly up trees using their proto wings? And for people who are trying to climb their career, we can imagine like uh, them in a forest full of trees, hop flying between the trees as they climb up into the canopy. And that's mm. often what it looks like. You work at a company for two to three years, you ship things, you can say, I did X, Y, and Z. And you can talk, you can tell the stories of what it was like, how you adapted when things that were unexpected happened or when you met resistance. That's all the hiring managers care about. And then when you're, you've got those stories, you and and those experiences there's usually a linger like you don't get much more you know you, you've learned what you can you've done what you can but unless you're at a high growth startup that's just like exploding and they're like and now we want you to be a manager and now we want you to be a director and now we want you to be a vp unless that's happening you're probably going to get to you know some top of a tree and be like i gotta hop to a bigger tree and you go hop mm. to another one and do the same thing scurry up a little bit hop scurry scurry and then there's also um, there's another method um, 
called the, I, I call it parachuting. This is the top down where you're at the top of a really big company or something like that. You've, you've clung to, you know, your, your stripe or something as it grew up and, and broke through the can forest canopy and it's the tallest tree in the, in the forest now. Or you climbed up as high as you could of the Microsoft or the IBM and you look out and you survey and you see another tree that you want to go to and you glide down to that tree and you land on the top of that tree. You know, you leave Meta to become a director at a startup. That happens a lot in Meta. Uh, people who uh, have, you know, senior and principal titles frequently leave for, for bigger roles at smaller companies. That's sort of the, the top down way of career progression. So these are the two ways that, you know, you're not supposed to spend more than, like some people, they see like five years on a resume and they're like, why was this person there for five years? Are they really pushing the envelope and trying hard or are they just coasting? I'm not saying that it's bad to stay for five years. I'm just saying you have to think about the story you're telling about that. Like, mm. why were you there as long as you did? Which is unusual. You don't really face that in a lot of other industries. Yeah, it, it is very interesting. And, you know, there's so many people who, you know, they keep switching. And it's almost as though, you know, for non-tech companies, it's you haven't stayed there very long, you know. Why not? Whereas now it's like, well, we stayed there too long. What's wrong? And it's it's such an interesting perspective to you know have to face when you're actually doing this sort of work. One of the best things you can do when you start a job is think to yourself, I'm going to be here for two to five years. What kind of story do I want to tell when I leave? What kind of projects do I want to show? Do I want to work on infrastructure? You know, be the tank. Uh, talk about how the projects that I worked were reliable and safe. Do I want to work on R&D type things, talk about the user research that we did, the trial and error we did to find product market fit? There's so many uh, different stories that you could tell. When you come in, it's best instead of thinking, wow, I'm going to be here forever. Oh, it's so amazing. This is my new family. No, they're not your family, although you may meet them at other companies in the future. You are more like a, a team. You're a, a, a team of hunter-gatherers, you've gathered together here during the winter solstice to prepare to go out and hunt the mighty bison. And this team of people is going to go hunt a bison, they're going to bring it down, and then they're going to take the beat back to their families. And then they'll probably team up with a different group of people to hunt a mammoth. And that's more of the way that this works. You are part of a team of cool collaborators who you might team up with again, but you're going to accomplish something. You don't have an open-ended scope to your role. You're going to go out, you're going to accomplish something, you're going to understand what you've accomplished, you're going to learn things from that accomplishment, and then you're going to go do it again. So think about what it is that you're coming into that role uh, hoping to accomplish for yourself and for the company. Yeah, and it's, it's such a proactive way of looking at a job as well because, you know, we are the kind of people who now, you know, live to work. So you want to have your objectives, you want to have your goals, and you want to be able to know what you want to build and what you want to achieve in that role. And not just, you know, hopefully not just live paycheck to paycheck for it. So, you know, what are the kinds of strategies that, you know, you would recommend for people coming into this role and looking to, you know, develop those skills for the next one? So one thing you can do when you start uh, your new role is you can write up uh, kind of like the story you want to tell when you are giving your resignation. Um, a lot of people, when they start a new job, they'll do this big post about they're so honored, they can't wait, they're going to be doing X, Y, and Z. Don't do that because you don't want to necessarily <laughs> share what you're going to be doing with people. What you want to do is you want to share a post about all the stuff you did at your past job. You want to say, I did this cool shit with these people. I love this person. This team was the best. I'm going to miss you so much. That's the energy you want. That's the relationship you want to carry with you. Or at least it's the one you want to project. Nobody out there knows if you all were at each other's throats. Nobody knows how, you know, Van Halen really feels about each other. It's okay. We ain't asking. We don't know. But it's all about what you project. Hiring managers love to see this sort of, you know, callback to all the people that you've worked with, all the projects that you've shipped, because it shows how, you know, what a great worker, how gracious you are, how uh, how much you've actually done. You weren't just sitting on your laurels the entire time. You actually were there and you were engaged and now you're, you're passing the praise and, and, and celebrating a win. So you always wanna like 
celebrate where you came from. And the best way to prepare for this is as soon as you take that new job, privately write that post for when you're moving on. You know, like, oh man, I loved working with this team. I loved shipping these projects. I was so phenomenally excited when I got my promotion to senior um, and, and led this other team to success. You know, you want to write the story of what you did, uh, not just for yourself, but also for the company. And then as you, you will have lots of opportunities to take on projects, to turn down projects, to work with some kinds of people. And sometimes you'll have to be really proactive and be like, no, I want this one in order to make that story come true. So you can yeah. write that post when the day comes. That is such a good way of doing it. And you're, you're giving yourself such tangible goals for, you know, what you want to be able to achieve. And by having those goals, you know, you, you can make them manifest in, you know, your own way. And yeah, it, it's such a great way of looking at it. It is. And, you know, you will encounter setbacks. There's a great book called The Dip. Um, which I do recommend reading. It's a way to figure out if you ever encounter trouble and you will encounter trouble. Like I know some people have an amazing career path where nothing goes wrong and they just get promotion after promotion and raise after raise and like everybody loves them. Most people, even very privileged people don't have that kind of experience. Uh, mm. Most people will encounter setbacks, they'll encounter friction, they'll have to work with people who don't like or respect them in some way, and they have to find a way to, and this is the key phrase here, deliver anyway. You know, yep. like the United States Post Office, you know, come rain, come storm, come hail, sleet, you know, how did you do anything anyway? Future managers don't care that you know that guy on that other team had it in for you or you just weren't set up for success by your manager you don't care you're not going to be set up for success in every project you're going to encounter another protectionist person who doesn't want you on their turf how did you deal with this person and deliver anyway and that's hmm. all that matters in the end you know this is this can get you through some dark nights how are you going to deliver anyway it's not about them and you and your personal relationship it's just about delivering the thing that is in that that uh that end post that you want to write but i was talking about how the dip so but invariably what if you're working at a job where everything is really really hard and you're wondering to yourself man like i mean i came in here with some high hopes but i is it supposed to be this hard Rachel? okay yeah um there are situations where things are unnecessarily difficult and there's a book called The Dip, it's pretty short, it's worth reading, which basically breaks down that there are three kinds of friction areas that you can encounter in your career. You can encounter cliffs, cul-de-sacs, and dips. Um, dips are the things that keep, that separate the best from the mediocre. You know, like you're, you, you, everybody else is dropping out because it's too hard to get to the other side of this. All the other ship manufacturers are like, we don't want to build those tiny microchips and you know only one dutch manufacturer makes it to the other side and it turns out those microchips are necessary for all cell phones everywhere true story uh there are things where the competition will fall off and if you push through that arduous nasty dip on the other side there are immense riches but sometimes it's a cul-de-sac no matter how hard you push there's nothing on the other side you just you're you're, you're gonna you're gonna plateau and be stuck there uh, and sometimes it's a cliff. You keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and then you just collapse, and everything collapses on the other side. And you have to be able to tell the difference between what's a dip, what's a cul-de-sac, and what's a cliff. Um, mm. And you also have to make sure that what's on the other side is worth it. For instance, being an award-winning cartoonist, <laughs> I made it past that dip. I became an amazing award-winning cartoonist. But it turns out award-winning cartoonists don't make enough money to get jaw surgery. So I had to find a new career. I pushed past the dip, but was what was on the other side really worth it? And you may find yourself in a similar situation where you're like on track to become the best designer in your firm, but then you realize that maybe you really enjoy user experience, or maybe you are really becoming an amazing um, computer scientist, but you realize that actually data is more your style. You have to ask yourself if what's on the other side of that dip is what you really want as well. 
Yes. And it's, it's always reflecting on that journey because, you know, you, you've had all this experience. You, you know, you do these things in your case, you, you were a cartoonist, you went to UI, you went to, you know, design, dev, and now it's, you know, education. And it's allowing yourself to kind of reflect on whether that direction is where you want to go. And, you know, checking in on those original objectives because none of our journeys are going to be completely linear, as you said. So, you know, having that, you know, little farewell post that you write at the beginning of each job and then kind of checking in on that and reflecting like is this what I still want to do is this what I want my farewell post to be it's mm -hmm. such a good way of being able to take personal stock of where you currently stand in terms of what you want your experience to be yeah. give yourself permission to change your mind it's something we forget yeah. about a lot especially like if you have family or you know spouses or other commitments that might be pushing you in one direction. A lot of times we do things that we do, um, partly because we're set up in a situation where we're not really encouraged to think about other ways of doing them. Mm. Uh, you know, if you are, um, your entire family has been taking you to dance classes and supporting your dance career since you were a little one, and then you suddenly decide you want to get into biology um, because you've also been really interested in fish your whole life, you might not realize that because all the people around you are, you know, giving you dolls with ballet costumes and telling you you're such a great dancer. And they're really setting up the structure around you that positions mm -hmm. you for this one thing. But it's okay to question, is this thing that I'm being positioned in the thing that I really want? Or do I have a different yes. calling that might have something even better on the other side of a dip for me? Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's being, yeah, giving yourself the permission to kind of explore those opportunities, but also understanding that you don't have to give up necessarily one for the other as well. Right. So you can always, you know, find ways to incorporate both or include that experience into whatever you do next. I mean, for me, if you go look at uh, beta.reactjs.org, I would say like all of those illustrations, I drew those. I still bring my art nice. skills and my cartooning skills to everything I do. I love to make talks and give them around the world because it was like creating a panel by panel slideshow of comics that I could I could uh, narrate. I used my skills to make amazing uh, demos that people love to participate in. And you could still participate in things like dance as a hobby, or you could lead you know, dance uh, therapy groups in your community. You don't have to abandon something you love you just might reframe it in a different way mm. or come back to it later. Maybe you go join a startup that makes millions of dollars and then you open a dance studio in your basement after you retire. Yeah, it, it, there's so many options available to use all the experiences that you've collected in your life. And it's, yeah, none of it is mutually exclusive. Not anymore anyway. No. And I would say that those experiences help make you a more diverse and interesting individual with more perspectives to add to the pool of solutions that people bring. If everybody at the table has the same experience of, you know, growing up in a certain community, going to a certain kind of school, and then getting a certain kind of internship at a certain kind of company, they only know how to solve a certain set of problems for a certain set of people. We need people with different backgrounds, different interests, hobbies, free time, um, you know, special niche interests, that's where real solutions come from. I'm certain of it. Yes, definitely. It, it's, yeah, you need, you need that broad range of thinking and ideas and experience in order to be able to bring those ideas and being able to create these new ways of approaching things that, you know, will help other people in the long run. It's great. So as part of the, you know, career things with just thinking about the way that you know, traditionally, a lot of people go, if you're interviewing, it's because you want to get that next job. But interviewing is a skill. And I think, you know, a lot of people forget that it's a skill that you need to be able to develop to be good at. And it's mm -hmm. a means to an end, but you still need to be able to put to put the time and training into learning how to do it right. So with your preparing for your next role talk, there was also, you know, talking about, you know, getting those muscles exercised while you're still in your job. And, you know, why is that so important? 
Well, for one thing, you don't want to wait until you're miserable at your current job to start looking at other jobs because then you're going to be like, oh, God, if I don't get this interview, it's curtains for me. And you're going to have to like be practicing your interviewing skills while you're legitimately interviewing. Oh, you don't want to be practicing your Japanese when you get to Japan. You practice it at home. Then when you get to Japan, you can order nicely. So, uh, <laughs> you know, like, like that's, that's, that's not a great situation to just do everything in production. And the same goes for interviewing. <laughs> oh, um, cowboy. In all of the... Uh, all, all of the big tech companies I've worked with, the best engineers I know, on principle, would engage in interviews once a year. They would have a special interview season when things were slow, where they would just go out and be like, hello, other company. Yeah, I'll listen to whatever op- offers that you might have. What can you do? They talk to their social network. They line up some interviews. They do this little practice run. If they get some offers, the offer is substantially better than what they have. They might think about it. But more often than not, they're just happy to stay in their role. And this is a way of them remembering, oh, yeah, these are the questions I'm going to be asked. This is what it's like to be whiteboarding. Um, I really should get more things like X into my portfolio because I want a job like Y. Once when I was interviewing, I realized that in order to get a management position, I would have to take on more opportunities that involved multiple people. Instead of doing everything myself, I mean, you know, like... I'm used to doing everything myself, but, you know, if you want to get hired to manage people, it's easier to get hired to manage people if you've actually been managing people. (laughs) Not necessarily as a manager, but you should probably be doing more projects that have other people to manage. And so you can prioritize taking on those opportunities that reflect the skill sets that the roles that you want are looking for. So even if you don't get the offers, you can always follow up and be like, well, I would love to know what your thoughts were because I'm still working on getting those kinds of roles in the future. If you have any feedback, I'd love to hear it. Most recruiters are not going to give you that feedback, but some of them will, and it's always invaluable. So interviewing on the regular, it's not you're cheating on your company or you're being sneaky or anything like that. You're doing your due diligence. You're investing in learning the skill you're getting used to the idea of, okay, okay, I'm going to be on a whiteboard. Okay, I, I should probably, like, check out some of these leak code exercises. Uh, I should probably engage with the advent of code with a friend of mine and do some pair coding so I can get more used to this sort of conversational back and forth when I'm trying to prove my skills to somebody on the other end who's just trying to figure out, like, what I know, what I'm capable of. It helps you depersonalize the experience. And because you're not desperate when you're doing it, because you're not like things aren't good because of that you're able to really put your best foot forward you're able to come in with a beginner's mindset an expansive growth mindset and not take everything as a life or death fight or flight situation a lot of people get really upset by the you know tech interview process because oh who needs to whiteboard algorithms it's not about whiteboarding algorithms that's not actually the test the test is to see do you lose your cool do you listen for direction? How do you pick apart a problem you've never seen before? Uh, are you really familiar with programmatical thinking or are you new to this? And that's the way you have to go into it. It's all about um, the relationship that you have with the interviewer and what happens when you finally hit that, that feeling. Because even if you pass the first two problems they gave you instantly and you had the answer, that means the interview would just dig deeper in the bucket and pull out the hardest problem period because the goal is to get you to hit a wall and see what happens when you start sweating people often think about the fact that these interview processes are all about the technical side and what you can do but not how you go about doing it and it's yeah it's one of those things where you're also they're interviewing you for your interpersonal skills, your soft skills, or the things that aren't things that you could Google for your solutions. But you're also kind of looking at them to approach, okay, well, how, what sort of questions do they ask? What kind of people are they? How do they think as well? And by the questions they ask you and the things that they ask you to do, you're also getting a feel for the kind of organization they are and, you know, whether that is going to be a fit for you as well. And yeah, it's, 
such an interesting two-way process that a lot of people forget is there because at the point when they usually approach it, they're in a time of need and you know, you don't get that space to be able to explore all these other important things that you need to do when you're looking at a potential employer. I actually want to take a moment to circle back to something that uh, was actually making the rounds on Twitter and Blind for a while. Mm-hmm. Somebody, I don't know if you've heard of Blind, but it's this sort of pseudo-anonymous app that you uh, can use if you're a member of a you know, certain cadre of uh, tech companies. And you can privately chat amongst yourself. Journalists love it. But the point is that sometimes you hear about these interviewers and you're like, my God, that person's really being unethical and biased. They're just, they're totally giving free passes and going easy on certain people and not on others. Hmm. And yeah, you know, that we, that can happen in pretty much any interview process, anywhere, any industry it happens all the time. And I know that's depressing. And I, yeah. I know there's somebody in the audience right now who's like, it doesn't matter how hard I try. If people don't like the color of my skin or the shape of my body. I'm going to get flunked. And why should I do this? Okay. For the, you know, I got to tell you, this works both ways. Just like you're saying, Michelle, it works both ways. Mm. Just as you are, they are screening you, you're screening them. If they have somebody like that working there, it doesn't matter how well you're set up to succeed. They will come for you. You don't want to work at a place like that. You do not want to work at a place where there are sharks in the water. If they allow that to survive in the org, you want to get rid of the false positive. Yeah. You want to flunk out of that. So if somebody says, oh, you didn't make the interview, and you, you're immediately feeling like, oh, I've been judged, I've been rejected, hold that thought. You do not know what was on the other side of that. You don't know if someone was being completely biased, and they were just like, mm. I don't like them. You don't want to work with that person. It's like a date. If somebody declines to go on a second date with you, just trust that it's meant to be that way. Go yes. on the next date with somebody else. I, I think it's just really important to remember that, you know, you cannot solve other people's biases and problems for them. And you cannot succeed in an org or a place where people are unaware of them. Let yeah. them flunk themselves. Absolutely. It's yeah, such an important thing now, especially because people are a lot more aware about being in environments which you know aren't conducive to it being healthy work environments and you don't want to put yourself into that position and you need to be aware of those flags during the interview process. So when, you know, when something comes off a little bit wrong, you need to ask yourself that question. It's like, why was that wrong? Or why did that feel not quite right? And, you know, it's someone's thinking about, well, if I have to face that vibe every day, is that going to be somewhere I want to be? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you're going to get that interviewer and you're just like, I don't know about this person. I don't feel right. And that's okay. And you should. Mm. So when you're interviewing, you can feel a great vibe. Sometimes you really feel great about the interviewer. Sometimes you don't. Feeling great about the people on the other side uh, is lovely, but I encourage you to discard that feeling because it's usually biased. You get in and you realize that that person was charming, but they're actually a prima donna to work with, or (laughs) you don't actually work with them at all. So, or they leave the company and you're like, but I liked you so much. Come back. Uh, (laughs) So don't index on the good feelings you get from people. But if you get bad feelings from people, index on that. Like it's a flag. You want to screen out the false positives. Um, Mm. You know, what is it? Um, Rely on false. It's okay to have some false negatives uh, to avoid the false positives. It's all the more reason why you do need to practice in all of these interviewing processes, because you need to understand what it's like to interact with these people, especially in, you know, small doses and, you know, get a feel for that kind of interaction and that kind of environment, how you should respond to that and how you should approach it when you do encounter that. Yeah. A great thing to do is after every one of your interviews, jot down two to three sentences about what you're feeling. Mm. Um, you know, like ask yourself, like, where in my body am I feeling this? Am I feeling really good about that? Am I feeling, how did I feel about the other people, about the questions they were asking me? Um, and you know, it goes both ways, building that body awareness, the body knows a lot of things. Um, Mm. and the mind tends to overrule it because it wants, it wants to think a certain way, either negatively or positively about the world, but your body will tell you a lot of things in in the heat of the moment that uh, your mind might forget about. So make sure you write those things down. Yes, 
It's a good way to, you know, you, you post-mortem your interviews and, you know, assess how it went. And it's also about continuous improvement for the next one, but it's also giving you a good kind of idea and perspective of, you know, how, how you feel about the company in general and whether it is somewhere you want to continue interviewing for. Yeah. It's also good to, I mean, also it's okay to record yourself in an interview and rewatch yeah. yourself to kind of get a vibe for like, how was I on this interview, especially in this era of remote interviews, like <laughs> good time uh, to yeah. like go back and be like, Hmm, you know, I did start to freak out when I was doing that particular situation. <laughs> I need to remember my breathing exercises when I start to feel that in my, in yeah. my chest. Uh, remember to take a deep breath and be like, can you explain that to me? Um, so I definitely encourage that. Um, and it, it's a good way of double checking things. And another yeah. thing that's good is to get clear on your values and goals when you're going into interviews. What do you value? What do you want to achieve with your one life uh, on this one planet? How is this going to let you do that? How are they going to get you closer to those goals? How do they align with your values? It does go both ways. You are interviewing them. And having these practice interviews, you're not telling them their practice, but having these practice interviews really gets you into that state of mind where you are analyzing them. It's all business. There's nothing on the table that, you know, you're happy where it is So at work. So if it doesn't work out, that's fine. If it did work out, oh, that's cool. I'm um, glad to hear it. Is it worth my while? Let's find out. Yes. Yeah. All very, very good things to be able to you know, take into account when you are entering these processes. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to some of those bonus questions. Uh, so what hobby or interest do you have that is most unrelated to your field of work? Oh, what, what hobby I have that's most unrelated to yeah. my field of work? Mm -hmm. Sewing. I used to make so, miniatures, little dolls with clothes and things, nice. sculpted animals when I was a kid. And I, something I, I picked up recently is um, sewing stuffed animals and their wardrobes. Uh, That's cool. I post about it on my Instagram, not on my Twitter. It's uh, <laughs> kind of like, it's just a little thing I do to center myself, put on a great, you know, K-drama in the background and make something nice. in 3D that I can hold with my hand. That is very, very cool. So are those things that you kind of design yourself or is it stuff that you found online to build? Well, it's kind of like, you know, I find a cute book of patterns in a, a bookshop over the holidays and then I get home and I'm like, I'm going to make one of these. I'm going to make another. And you know what? I'm going to get some <laughs> tissue paper. I'm going to edit the main pattern. I'm going to turn this bunny rabbit into a heron. I want to see if I can do that. Uh, so it's, it, it's sort of like riffing on a classic. That is very cool. I do like the engineering aspect of sewing. It is so much fun. Like it's something I mainly do clothes, but I do, you know, crochet amigurumi as well. And you know, it's fun taking a pattern and kind of going, hmm, I wonder if I can add like an extra feature here or adjust the way this one looks for proportions. It's good exercise. Or do things like putting uh, little uh, heavy earth magnets into bunny paws so that they can hold uh, yes. metal teacups. Oh, very cool. I do like that. That is very, very good. <laughs> it's all about the detailing. It is all about the details. Okay. And which childhood book holds the strongest memory for you? Animal Farm. Uh, <gasps> and I don't know if that's like a childhood book, but uh, I remember I watched the cartoon and I read the book and I always loved Animal Farm. I specifically love Boxer the horse because he mm. always tried so hard. I, I hated what happened to Boxer in the end, but that story really stuck with me for the rest of my life. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, it's rare that you find a book that just impacts you so much that you just hold on to it, even though, you know, the story itself, like whether or not it's a simple or complex story, like it's one of those things that really kind of, you know, it gets into your psyche and it gets into, you know, the way that you think about things and... It's great. Well, I think, I mean, every time I revisit Animal Farm as I grow older, it yeah. meaning changes for me. Mm. Now, when I revisit it, like, you know, when I was a kid, it was a story about animals. When I was yes. a teenager, it was a story about, um, you know, historical governmental effects. Uh, when I was, you know, you know, in my 20s, it was something else. 
but now I, I read Animal Farm and I can almost see it as an example of, it was originally about communism, but mm. now you can kind of see it as being like the story of the startups. You know, there are these animals that they decide they're going to build their own farm. You know, we're going to have our own company. And it starts with these great lofty goals and everyone's participating and being rewarded according to their efforts. But then the system becomes huge and it's not designed to protect the people. They're not working toward a common goal. There's a ruling class. There are people who definitely are benefiting from the hard work of others. There's, you know, a recruitment program. And this thing that had started as a dream has now grown up to become a system like every other system. In a way, it reflects endgame capitalism more than it does <laughs> communism. And I just, I think it's one of those books that keeps giving. Every time you go back and it read is. it, you're like, oh my God, I see that. I see how that is true. Yes. Oh my gosh. Uh, and it's told through allegory with adorable animals. Yes, it is. And it, it's... It's an interesting way, like, again, it's not exactly a kid's book, but it is one of those things where you can kind of grow and reflect on it and, you know, see how it changes over time with your experiences and your understanding of the world. It's not a kid's book? Well, I wish someone had told my mother that. <laughs> <laughs> well, kids as in a young kid, but I mean, like, yeah, when you, okay, it's like a lot of cartoons these days, like, you have them for kids, but some of the content they won't quite get until they're a bit older and it's yeah it's one of those things where you take what you are able to understand and absorb at the time and then it just kind of grows with you yeah i think avatar the last airbender is probably like that although i have to give that cartoon credit because it really didn't assume that kids couldn't grapple with and understand the content that it had um yeah that was definitely a, a step in the right direction for content created for kids Absolutely. It's it's good that there are all the content starting to get a little bit more sophisticated now, and I'm really enjoying it, watching it again. <laughs> yeah. And lastly, what advice would you give someone who would like to do what you do, and what advice should they ignore? I'm going to go against the grain here. I'm going to yeah. say uh, there are a lot of people who are like, you don't need to learn computer science or algorithms or anything like that to get a job in tech. Yeah, sure, you don't. If you just want to like be putting blocks of user interfaces together. But the truth is that stuff is really fun. It's fun. And if you find it fun, which I didn't realize I'd find it fun for so long, people kept being like, you're an artist, so do design stuff. It took me a long time before I was like, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Functional programming is legit. Cool. This is <laughs> Lambda functions. What? You know, like once you get in there and you start learning about these things, it can be a lot of fun. Systems design. Uh, this is this is this is what the human brain was designed to work on and should you be forced to learn all this stuff to get certain jobs no but you won't be if you want to learn these things it can be fun and it can really change the caliber of jobs that are available to you the caliber of puzzles that you get to solve the kind of projects that you work on so i'm going to go against the grain and say you should 100 percent get into learning about computer science if it's interesting to you you don't have to learn it to get a job, but you might have a lot of fun learning it and find that you end up finding a job that's even more rewarding because you do. Uh, that is the advice that I would both give you and tell you not to listen to. Don't feel like, you know, whiteboarding is a scary, traumatic thing. If you've ever pair coded with somebody, which is easy to do, get advent of code and cr come Christmas time, get someone to do it with you, open up VS Code, turn on uh the the feature that allows you and someone else to code at the same time in the same terminal uh and start you know screen sharing and chatting and laugh and talk about how you're solving the same problems together and you'll find that it's a lot of fun that this can be a lot of fun and so that is that is the advice i would both give and and tell you to ignore that is great advice and it's yeah i I'm still pro tertiary education for computing because I found the foundations so interesting. I found learning about the art of the science interesting. And it was just one of those things for me where it helped make everything else make sense. And when you learn about all these courses, it's very utilitarian a lot of the time. And, you know, it's like, this is how you program. This is how you, you know, these are your control structures, but it's not always the fun part. <laughs> Sometimes like the other bits are the bits that are fun and it's, you don't know that's fun until you give it a shot and try and explore and see whether that is a thing that you have a passion for. 
and it can you know, make an ordinary job more interesting because you're looking at it in these other more interesting ways. It's kind of like uh, the difference between like, like anyone can feed chickens for a living. You don't have to understand chickens to feed them. Yeah. But if you dig in and learn about chicken anatomy and diseases for chickens and, you know, what kinds of diets chickens like, et cetera, then the act of being, um, you know, a chicken farmer is suddenly that much more rich, more interesting. You might even come up with a way to grow amazing, happy, healthy chickens uh, <laughs> that none of your other farmer friends have come up with. It just, it can lead to a more enriching job and, and work life. Instead of just rotely doing the thing, you understand yeah. the thing that you're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's a great way to end this conversation. So thank you so much, Rachel Lee, for speaking with me today. It's been amazing to learn about your Thank journey you, and your passion. Yeah. It's just been so great listening to how passionate you are about, you know, technical education and, you know, the importance of, you know, looking for work and the process of doing that and the way that you, you know, you use perspective to make that part of your skill development rather than, you know, a chore. Oh. A lot of the stuff that we think of as chores is actually really fun. If we, if we just um, have the leisure to reframe it. So whenever you find yourself in a stable situation where you have the time and can do those reframe, uh, those reframes, do it. Yes, definitely. It's, it's all part of reflecting for where you are and where you want to be. Okay. So if people would like to learn more about what you do, where can they go? Oh, well, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Rachel Neighbors, N-A-B-O-R-S on Twitter. My website, rachelneighbors.com. I'm working on a book uh, to help people find their next job after they found the nice. first job. Uh, so I'll probably be posting about that in one of those two places. Um, let me see. Uh, doo -doo. And if, of course, I mentioned those courses. If you're interested in learning about CSS animations or even cartooning, courses.rachelneighbors.com is a great place to stop. Okay, so thank you so much, Rachel Lee. It's been wonderful to speak with you today, and I hope you have an amazing evening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. Developer education is such an important part of having an inclusive and active developer community. And it's wonderful to see the ways in which we as a community are making more space for it. It was also brilliant to speak with Rachel Lee about the skill of interviewing and how having a mindset of preparing for your next role makes us better at what we do. To learn more about Rachel Lee and what we discuss in the show, or to connect with us, please visit the Steam Powered website at steampoweredshow.com. You can also find out more about Rachel Lee on LinkedIn and Twitter at Rachel Neighbors, R-A-C-H-E-L-N-A-B-O-R-S, the links for which will be in the show notes. If you enjoyed this conversation, please let me know. Subscribe to this show, leave a comment, or share this with your geeky or geek curious friends. You can also support Steam Powered on Patreon and Ko-fi, the links for which will also be in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.